Okay, next. The shadow of exploitation in Weber. Unless anybody wants to go back to a previous point. Tiberius, how do you feel about reading these ones? Uh, yeah, I'll read it. So we have the shadow of exploitation in Weber. So Weber's definition of the concept of class says nothing about exploitation, but he does touch on the issue in places. How he deals with the problems generated by exploitation reveals the inner logic of his general approach to class. The problem of the performance and appropriation of labor effort within the production, primarily as an issue of work discipline, the quote-unquote incentive to work and economic efficiency, quote, raising peace rates has often had the result that not more but less has been accomplished in the same time because the worker reacted to the increase not by increasing, but by decreasing the amount of work. I'm assuming that means the the increase of payment per piece. Yeah. Yeah, that's an interesting, like, yeah. Uh, Shall we keep going here? Do you want to, yeah, keep going and we'll, we'll deal with them at the end. Weber concludes the technical problems of worker productivity can only be solved when the laborer adopts the Protestant work ethic that generates a moral imperative for them to expend a maximum of effort. Labor must be performed as it were, as as if it were end in itself. Weber cites primary primary conditions for optimization to occur: the optimization of aptitude for the function, the optimization of skill acquired through practice, and the optimization of inclination for the work. Weber cites a variety of conditions for indirect compulsion to be effective. Employers have a free hand in hiring and firing workers. Workers lack both ownership and control over the means of production, and workers bear the responsibility for their own reproduction. Let's stop it there. Let's stop it there for uh, oh, there's a good bit there. Um, like, tell us again now how how like Weber has seen the the SDP, SPD. Can somebody ex- explain that? Like, this is like a capitalist manual is this not like a an mba manual from like fucking harvard here i think there is a critical bone in weber's body but it's it's very much like the liberal foucauldian where you're like damn society's an anthill shit sucks oh well like it doesn't have the fighting spirit of marxism it has a resigned spirit of knowing how society works and being sort of like proto-structuralist about it. I'm like, yeah, what are you going to do? That, yeah, that's how he's in the SPD. He's part of the revisionist current. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, yeah, the revisionist it's basically, that basically Weber's, what, what Weber's talking about is that this is the way that society is structured and expanding the material output of society requires these kinds of things to happen. Where if... You know, if under capitalism, the worker doesn't have a compulsion to continuously expand material output because they don't see immediate benefits from that because there is exploitation happening that is continuing to siphon off that material output, then why would the worker not then like get what they need to feel comfortable and just sort of like have more time to sort of be themselves. There's, there is an issue of incentive that Weber is, is I think correctly identifying in the way that capitalism operates. And he's just kind of stopping there and going, okay, well, we want society to have more material things. What do we need to do in order to get that? We've had a couple of discussions in the discord about that kind of thing. So like, well, <laughs> it's it's not like it's a, a closed issue for a lot of people. Well, I was just gonna say this is all. These are all the same points that uh, that uh, the IMF restructuring plans made for uh, <laughs> po- post communist societies, right? This, it's it's literally like point for point. It's the same thing. It's the points that the neoclassical socialists came to 
in uh, the Eastern Bloc, the socialist economists, when they became market socialists, and then they started to think through this stuff, and they just basically came to Weber's points about, yeah, this is how we optimize a market, is we include all of these things. Maybe we reduce the indirect compulsion a bit, but like, you know, come on. This is a market, baby. You got to deal <laughs> market, with it. Baby. Yeah. <laughs> and and Weber's right. This is very much like, uh, at least in the terms of like instrumental rationality and optimization, you know, kind of flowing directly from instrumental reason. I can take a math course on optimization before even getting to its applications. Like it's actually fairly abstract and has this very direct plug-in into class domination. Like he's not wrong about optimized management. It's just as a replacement for a theory of exploitation is where it's really suspect. Um, it's also like, you know, in the post-communist debates, it's sort of like returning to this is what is an answer to the Leninist idea of perpetual heroism just like pushing, 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 pushing everyone through collective spirit. Let's like hype everybody up, et cetera, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. Like, you know, yeah, you could try that, but it doesn't work. And also like, this is just way more effective. So like, why don't we just go back to these like core liberal principles of how capitalism works and how it's the most productive thing ever? That's the fucking goofiest shit about um, Leninist ideology is when it picks up on not just like anti anti work, but like pro work. Like, be like Joey Stakov who comes into the office on Saturdays, like, kind of stuff. You take the Protestant work ethic and you cut out the indirect compulsion. Yeah, right? yeah, and you just have direct compulsion, right? Yeah, direct compulsion <laughs> plus Protestant work ethic, right? Oh, God. Yeah. Plus electrification equals communism. <laughs> equals communism. And then, like, uh, you know, um, Obviously, like, Weber was not really right about Protestantism, but, like, his sort of theoretical points still stand about, like, these are things that are conducive for capitalism to work. Yeah, I really do like the idea of, like, get people to love their work. <laughs> That's, like, you just got to look at all the bullshit fucking self-help stuff all over the place and just see that. That is, that is, like, everywhere now in non-Protestant societies, like, it's fucking, it's totalizing. It's definitely post-Protestant, right? It's this weird Californian shit. Yeah, I was going to say yeah. there, was a, there was a discussion somewhere in one of these circles about like why tech companies have all the frou-frou bullshit that they do. And a lot of that is just adding frillery to, to what is essentially like a hyper-exploitative system in order to make people like to incentivize people to essentially give their entire life over to the company. Yeah. Like if, so, if your if your entire life is there and you have a certain level of material comfort cuz you can you can go and, and hang out on the beanbag chair and take a nap or you can go down to the cafeteria where some chef is preparing whatever garbage bullshit that they're preparing. Uh, you know, you never have to leave. And if you never have to leave, well, you're already at work, so you might as well get some work done, right? Okay. Um, Kyle, would you take the next couple of slides? Yep. Okay, so we continue the shadow of exploitation. Uh, workers having some control over jobs restricts the rationality of production. So, you know, if uh, you have, like, shop floor uh, management, uh, that's restricting the rationality of production. Weber argues that the problem of getting a technically rational level of work effort from workers who control their jobs, job protections, or if they're unionized, etc., is similar to the problem of getting work effort from slaves. Um, mm. Okay, I mean, I see what his reasoning is there. It's it's basically the idea, like, the slave could be like, well, yeah, but, like, what are you going to do, kill me? You know? Like, I, I have a stake in my own life. Whereas if you have no job protections, no unionization, you're responsible for your own existence in a way 
that uh, a slave is not because they're the property of a slaveholder. So they live a life of absolute misery. They might die, but they're not responsible for their life. Well, um, except that's also not even largely true of slaves. Uh, right. It, people who are enslaved often when you're talking about chattel slavery, especially mm -hmm. they're not typically given the means of their own survival. They have to take like the half day, day and a half, whatever it is off that they have to reproduce themselves in order to make it through the next week. Mm -hmm. Starting to think Faber just didn't know very much about slavery. Hmm. Um, technically, most efficient performance of labor effort by workers therefore means workers must not only be expropriated from the means of production, but lose all control over their jobs and the labor process. The lack of rationality may be ameliorated where the workers own the means of production, but the interests of the workers may also be often in conflict with the interests of the organization. Weber is hand in hand with modern contemporary neoclassical economists on the problem of worker effort. I would think that is like economists, yes, but management theorists, definitely no. Right. Uh, why? Why do you say that? Uh, because uh, management theorists are all about like, you know, you being the quote unquote startup of you. Uh, like that, that like workers should be self-motivated workers should be self-organizing as far as like the highly profitable sectors of the economy this idea of workers being completely disempowered at the uh, mercy of management where they have no autonomy whatsoever uh, is not in vogue in sort of the popular end of management theory as opposed to the how do we organize Walmart side of things right however this is in lockstep with taylorism yeah 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 yeah. no for sure uh okay. i think this this rhymes with taylorism quite a bit but you know uh just the claim that weber is hand in hand with modern contemporary neoclassical economists it's like yeah that's true like i for all the reasons i just talked about with like the post-communist thing uh just there is a split in management neoliberal management theory that is very yeah. different from this. Yeah. 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 No, I, finance is different than economics. Like there's so yeah. many arbitrary splits. Yeah. Right. Like, right. Because in order to make that kind of like hyper alienation of the worker to their work, like function, you basically have to strip anything about the work that sort of requires the human to be anything other than like a very basic automaton. You have to take the, the skill and sort of craftsmanship out of the work in order to make that possible. Because if, mm -hmm. if you have people who do have a kind of skill and craftsmanship, then alienating them from that in that extreme a manner really does just does not work with um, like the actual output of anything that is sort of like worthwhile to the capitalist system. Mm hmm as well, what you're talking about there, Kyle, with that kind of split is like that type of, you know, uh, management uh, theory is really built around organizations whereby they have creative workers trying to uh, create something that is essentially something that they can put a, a fucking patent on, you know? Yep. And that's why they're getting like the most skilled creative people. It's like a management theory for a different style of work. Yes. And it's something that filters out to society in general because those are the most desirable jobs. So people try to get into those jobs. So they try to adapt the mindset of those workers. Mm -hmm. uh, but always, it doesn't mean that they actually get to work under those conditions at Walmart or Amazon or whatever. You know exactly. Yeah, unless you're in headquarters. But, but even still, like a, a guy I worked for is my boss one time. He used to work for Amazon, and uh, in like you know head office -y type stuff and they worked he said it was, the hours are incredibly long and yeah so there's nothing to do with the number of hours worked the number of hours worked should be just as much as humanly possible for like all the reasons tiberius brought up like you should live at work you should sleep there you should bathe there you should just dedicate your entire life to it but you should be like self-motivated entrepreneurial at the cutting edge 
when I worked for Ericsson, I used oh, to okay. sleep at work. But that was usually during work time when I was like really hung over. So what I do is there was a there was like a disabled toilet on the second floor of my building and nobody ever went in there. So it was always spotless and it was quite big. So you could go in, you could lie down on the floor and sleep for a few hours. It was fantastic. This is the kind of irrationality that comes with a worker's own the needs of production. Time. <laughs> Get in yeah. the way of progress. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's oh, interesting. I'm a roll. It's interesting here that the fourth point, fifth point here about uh, the interests of the workers where they own the means of production may also be in conflict with the interests of the organization. Like this getting to the problems with market kind of socialism, you know, or like co-ops. Or co-ops yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. And like, you know, unless you break that the value form and that whole stuff up, which we're talking about in the fundamentals, the principles reading group, um, the ownership by the workers of the means of production is is no panacea okay kyle last two points on the shadow of exploitation all right okay weber does acknowledge rationalization has perverse effects that systematically threaten human dignity and welfare particularly because of how it intensifies bureaucratic domination nevertheless he did not treat this problem of extracting work effort as central to the class relations of capitalism and the conflicts of interest that those relations engendered so this is kind of like this is like his side gig talking about like the conditions of labor management is like not the core of his theory of class conflict in capitalism. It's just a kind of technical concern that is incidental because he follows a neoclassical theory where production isn't really that important. So, you know, it's all all kicking kicking off off in the the chat chat here. here. Permaculture is getting getting fucking fucking sliced. (laughs) sliced. This, this is, is the shadow, shadow of permaculture in the slide. We need Derek, Derek here right, right now. now. Don't think he's the, even the, here. The this. shadow of permaculture. I'm here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, okay. Yeah, uh, Derek let's... out here disrespecting my permies, and I, I will not stand for it. <laughs> <laughs> I per. <coughs> okay. Um, I'll tell you a story on another time about how I worked with a collective called the Green Triangle Collective. We had a weird mixture of Chavismo plus green permaculture could solve everything. And now they're basically just liberals. So, you know. Um, so you mean they're hippies? Yeah. Well, you know, anarcho hippies just become hippies. Yeah. 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 Or they're just um, hippies. It's a circle yeah. of life, Derek. <laughs> That's proper systems theory, Esri. I like this. <laughs> Proper systems theory. Um, (laughs) The the function of something is what it does. Oh, yes. Hey, Sonoma County is like a storage locker for freeze-dried hippies, so I know. So so what it is is a way for hippies to have NGO jobs. Like, Oh, there's a lot um, of that. No, it's funny. Anyway, I actually don't have a problem with permaculture. I just, whenever people are like, we can use permaculture to completely kick our addiction to industrial grain. And I'm like, what's the time scale you're talking about there? But yeah, uh, let's just get on task here. Ramifications. Okay. Um, I think Esri should read this one. Esri. I will. Okay. So ramifications. Explicitly linking exploitation to the concept of class changes the way class conflict is understood. Exploitation infuses class analysis with a special kind of normative concern. Exploitation draws attention to how class conflict does not simply reflect conflicting interests over distribution. Exploitation emphasizes how the owners are dependent on the workers for their own well-being and the ways in which the workers have capacities for resistance that are organic to the class relation. Exploiters must seek ways of responding to resistance of the workers that reproduce rather than destroy their interaction with the exploited. Any thoughts on this stuff here? One thing I really like about like emphasizing exploitation, which it you know puts the whole thing in a dynamic motion that the exploiter and the exploited are constantly in a dance, and this dance needs to be maintained by the exploiter to continue itself, which that to me is the core dance in your life, you know, your working life, that dance between your you know being an employer or an employee to put the emphasis on 
your consumption above and beyond this core like day-to-day interaction of exploitation seems to me just to be a great mistake of analysis well it leads to like arguments where you don't have to fundamentally change class structure to do anything i mean like and it also leads to some very weird there's some very weird pictures of socialism that i don't know occasionally come up in places that we all kind of hang out where we talk about whether or not we could have a socialism where everyone has a uh, a um, hundred thousand dollars a year worth of consumptive value, but they also have no cars and um, public transit and other strange things. Not that <laughs> any of the things are strange, but like that, that being your primary dynamic is strange. Um, I do think exploitation is like the theoretical and like normative heart here. And normative might strike people weird, but like Kant was in the air when Marx was writing and one of the phrasings of Kant's categorical imperative is to always treat people as ends and not as means. It's really hard for me to look at an anti-exploitation ethic and not see a family resemblance. So I'm rather comfortable with the normative dimensions of this. But what I like so much about this is that, yes, the normative dimensions are present, but the theory of exploitation in itself, it has a contribution completely aside to that Indeed, there are quite chilling, you know, sort of Stalinist views of exploitation where certain forms of it are fine because we're in a historically necessary stage or something. But the theory itself or the sort of, I don't know, the basic structure of the theory is really where Marxian analysis is different. When the concept of a fair wage is a contradiction in terms, you know, that's just different from liberal analyses. That's a a fundamental break from distributional analyses. It's, um, I mean, it's, it's everything that Marxists think it is in a way and more. But when you see Marxists talk about which society that they uphold or something, you realize that a lot of people have like asterisks and are willing to accept certain forms of exploitation or define them away, or it becomes rather complicated honestly, to see how to get out of exploitation. And nobody exemplifies that better than people that say that they're against it and what they end up standing. Kyle, do you want to say something? Oh, I was just going to say, yep, let's move on. Yeah. Um, <laughs> was, it, was, that, was that just the, the clearing from a truth bomb or um, I lose everything? No, 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 no. I just, just <laughs> completely agree with it. Yeah. Got it. Yeah, me too. Sorry, I was just struggling. No with notes. My mute button. Yeah, <laughs> struggling with my mute button. Okay, uh, Esri, we got. Uh, let's do these two ramifications in one goal. Let's see if we can. Sure. As individuals, worker power depends on the scarcity of labor power, so they can extract skill rents, and how they expand their productive energy. As a collective, worker power depends on their ability to collectively regulate the terms of exchange on the labor market, unions, for instance, and through their ability to control the organization of work, surveillance, and sanctions within production. A note from Tom, he never even discusses their revolutionary power, SMH. Yeah, yeah like, so this was a point about, like, uh, this was not a critique of Weber, but a critique of Eric Olin Wright, that he never mentioned in the ramifications of exploitation revolutionary action. I just found that kind of telling. It's a good reason for that, Tom. We'll get to it later. (laughs) Um, Instead of understanding the capacity of workers to control their own effort as a fundamental source of class-based power available to workers in their class struggles with capitalists, Weber sees this control as one of the obstacles to forming a fully rationalized economic order. Importance of understanding how the way one theorizes the concept of class directs attention towards different kinds of normative agendas. Wright claims that Weber is undoubtedly more self-conscious than Marx about trying to keep his values from shaping his conclusions. Weber admitted he had values, is I guess what he's saying. Do you think that's what he's saying? I'm ribbing Marx for pretending yeah, to be an anti There's a snarky comment about Marx. Yeah, Mar- <laughs> yeah, Marx is like an anti-moralist that's like, I don't have any morals. Also, Everyone should have equal dignity in a communist society under the sun. But I'm not a utopian. 
No, absolutely. Um, Marx tries to like keep uh, any kind of a moralism out of his stuff, but you know, it's there in what you focus on in some extent. You know, part, you can't get rid of the normative. No, you can't get rid of the normative, but Marx talks like you can. And part of what makes his normative impulses so strong and yeah, they do sometimes affect his ability to like predict how things are going to unfold. Like I'll, there's a number of times where that happens. And part of it is because he barely admits that he has normative commitments. The only one he'll cop to is freedom. And you could probably define that away somehow if you wanted. I think it's because of the way Marx is an edgelord about morals because of the intervention he was trying to make in, you know, socialist theory. But well, I also think he, he conflate if the thesis on Feuerbach, uh, thesis 11, tries to make the Hegelian argument that you ultimately can't make an is-ought distinction. I think it does lead to a lot of weird retrojecting, particularly in the 1850s when he's like, well, you know, crisis, therefore revolution. I mean, that comes up in letters over and over again in the 1850s. In the 1860s, he's like, now that was dumb. Look at those perhunists over there trying to make capitalism worse to get the workers to rebel. That's stupid. I mean, and I'm, I'm only vaguely simplifying what Marx said. The issue, though, is like, for example, the reason why he won't cop to a lot of those things is like, when you talk about equality, um, it's mystified. When you talk about all these moral virtue notions, they're highly mystified in the way they're actually used um, dishonestly. What I also find interesting, though, is you know, you made that dig at Marx, but I actually think it's interesting that Weber is trying to go back to recognizing the Azalt distinction more self-consciously than Marx, but ends up, he mm -hmm. ends up doing it anyway. Like, this is where yeah. I think Marx does have a point. He can't get out of a normative framework either, even though he's trying to in a way Marx would have never bothered with. Yeah, I would agree with that, too, and that ultimately, like, it's hard not to read Weber as sort of an instruction manual instead of a real critique. Like uh, uh, Weber is also just kind of like following the trend of what was happening with sociology at the time, you know, the sort of professionalization of it and cutting out the normative content, or I should say disguising the normative content in order to uh, become more scientifically respectable. Yeah. No, it's in those ways that I have some sympathy for, like, <laughs> for Adorno's just hate on for sociology. But you can't ultimately do social science without having some normative commitments. And that's something that Wright argues for explicitly. Yeah, I mean, he, it's a hate on for sociology based on sociology's, quote, positivism, unquote, mm -hmm. um, which becomes a slur word for hiding your normative values by pretending you don't have any. Which, to be fair to Adorno, he eventually accuses Marx of. Yeah, that's why I was kind of chuckling at this. Um, anyway, to continue yeah, the continue little on. list of ramifications. Weber's preoccupation with technical rationality in the workplace is very much in line with the interests of owners and managers. Duh. Marx's analysis of linking the problem of work effort to exploitation directs class analysis towards normative concerns centered on the interests of workers. Now, Tom, you have a note here, again, no mention of revolutionary workers, but what the content of the class interests of workers is, is exactly the site of, you know, are things that are in the interests of workers possible in this system? Or if you could get the maximal interests for workers, how much of society would you have to rearrange? And I do think there's revolutionary implications if you're really, you know, trying to maximize workers' interests. That's, um, I don't know. I feel like you're pushing the logic of what Wright is saying in this chapter. There. Wright, Wright wants, you know, a, an evolutionary revolution into socialism. So it's like, right, that, that's not really, he's not thinking of revolution in the same way. But I do take this sort of class interest framework on, and I that's more or less the way I think about it. Like, yes. so. No, I, I take it on too, but I just say like that there are different types of stuff that classes can do. You know, like there's a difference between like trying to get higher wages and trying to do a revolution. They're like different behaviors. They're like different categories. And he's, 
not mentioning a kind of a category that has happened throughout history. It has happened, even if it has failed and gone down the wrong avenues. It's just interesting that right is omitting this part. Yeah, I think ultimately class interest requiring you to reorganize the economy is like the heart of the Marxist argument for economic revolution. And however toothless that vision becomes, that basic structure is there. Yeah, but I do think Tom is getting onto something about like what EO Wright brackets out in ways that are, I don't know, conflating some normative values and maybe instrumental in and of themselves. Like I, I want to read this charitably, but we all know where his politics ultimately lays, which is basically an analytic form of Bernsteinian socialism. Like, yeah, yeah like that's precisely my point that he's doing like essentially like going from Marx to Weber and he's doing it through analytical Marxism. You know, there's that journey there and that like you leave out core elements of like what it is to be, you know, working class versus the bourgeoisie here and the, the struggle within exploitation having revolutionary potential. The fact that it's not mentioned, I find that very telling. Like, the other, yeah. like the other thing I would say that the first point here, you take that point as like a diss on Marx. I see this like that Wright claims that like Weber has been undoubtedly like, more self-conscious about it. Like writing for writings. Trying to keep his values from shaping his conclusions. Like Weber talks about this in a way that Marx doesn't. Like, like, but like, it's it's a relative claim. Even if Weber isn't good at it, Marx is worse. I don't know. Like, how much does Weber talk about? Like, like, would he turn himself a socialist? He would have in the early period. I don't know in his later period if he still. Yeah, I, I really wonder about yeah later Weber's connection with socialism. But in his early work, yeah, he was a socialist and. Not only was he a socialist for that period, a number of socialists think exactly like him. <laughs> yeah, I just want to say that like Weber is really interesting because his arguments against unions are pretty much the same as Pareto's. But interestingly, like Weber doesn't go down that road of like supporting fascism in the name of economic rationality and reasserting liberalism. He he goes down the sort of like, yeah, life sucks road. Yeah. That kind of like, I am uh, disenchanted and alienated from society and this is bad, but there's nothing to be done about it. Yeah, yeah. he doesn't uh, embrace the barbaric instrumental rationality. He just is like, uh, life sucks. I'm just going to go write more sociology and be sad over here. I mean, yeah, yeah, that's what I gathered. He, he really does invent modern sociology in a way that like Marx is like a foundational figure, but he's like, I don't know. Got, it's like, him and Durkheim are the two opposite poles of it. And we don't talk about Durkheim because Durkheim's even more like whatever is is right. Like, absolutely. <laughs> in fact, not only is it right, we should figure out a way to use sociology to make it more writer and more is -er. So... <laughs> <laughs> but but like most sociologists I know take more after Weber than Marx or Durkheim. They're mostly kind of depressed libs. Of course, there are others. Yeah, there's a bunch of British people involved in this conversation too. But you know, whatever. God damn Brits! God fucking damn it! I'm agreeing. I'm, I'm fucking everywhere. I agree with you, Tom. It's why I'm a Britonite, not because I think that the English were good enough to have invented capitalism, but because. Only the English could have unleashed such a horror upon the world. Yeah, oh, this damn. chthonic Brennerism. It's in their genes. <laughs> <laughs> it's the shape of their heads. It's the shape yeah. of their heads, let's be honest. The square-headed <laughs> bastards. <laughs> Just a racial realism, but only for the English. Yeah, like, this is, the, this that's, is my type that's of show. That. My type of show. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm sure, I'm sure you could do that and then draw on a bunch of analytical Marxist Brennerism thought and get like a really good syncretist reactionary current on Twitter. If people are taking notes, I get 15%. That's just how it is. Seriously, what we need to do is like bring back like, uh, what's the one with the head? What's that one? Uh, phrenology. phrenology. We should phrenology. bring back like, we should bring back a phrenology <laughs> where it's like, 
where it's phonology, but only for the English. <laughs> no, 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 no. Even even better. Like it's uh-huh. it's written by like black people, Jew- Jewish people, Irish people, and it's all like showing how how scientific evidence for how stupid the British and the Germans and the French are. It'd be fucking I don't know. brilliant. I don't know. There's a market for this, and it's uh, scaring me. It's just, it's, uh, <laughs> it was a joke, oh. man. It was a joke. You know, I'm not got- that orthodox Marxian where I'm going to bring back phrenology, okay? Hegel Seriously, had a better the- position on phrenology than Marx did. The algorithm has just responded positively to this. We suddenly just got 10,000 live watchers on the stream yeah. since we brought because- because we said phrenology, and so now we're yeah. tapping into the centrist reactionary current. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> Love it. Um, did we have anything to say about the previous slide's ramifications? Uh, <laughs> yeah, let's let's go back. Let's have a look. Yeah, because uh, I read those with the idea that we would be commenting on them later. You know what? It is interesting, though, um, and Kyle's right to point it out, how much this rhymes with Moshe Robert, all those people who start yeah. off as cynicalist and Marxist to go fash in Italy in particular to reestablish some sort of liberal order. Like they had the same logic. And what's interesting about it is it all comes from focusing on monopoly capital and then managerial competition within that. That's the basic assumption that leads to these frameworks. And mm-hmm. what's fascinating about that, if you'd have looked at like I, I pointed like Doug Lane and I were arguing about this one day and I pointed out to Doug, I was like, look, say what you want to about monopoly capital theories. Everybody, everybody from like 1920 to 1950 believed them except for one person. And that was Grossman. And Grossman was making predictions about the fall of capitalism that were wrong. Now I defend a lot of Grossman's math and stuff, but like, you can't fathom that there are new countervailing tendencies that he can't see and that capitalists can seize on. So uh, I do think that there's something in the air that's not just a vapor that leads to this logic that was actually part of a transition in capitalism that's over now. That's very over now. And I think it comes up here too. I mean, like worker power depends on the scarcity of labor power so they can extract skills rents. And how they can expand their productive energy. Well, skills rents problems are a real issue that we're still having, right? But they work differently than the skills rents problems of the early 20th century, very differently. Um, skills rents now are, are a lot more dependent on state produced monopolies than like selling them to, to say, um, individual capitalist firms. And the firms that they sell them to tend to not be actually all that profitable without state help. That's very different than what Weber's describing. But it is interesting how if you took Weber's time period and extrapolated it out like infinitely into the future, you could have come to these conclusions pretty pretty honestly, I think. Because it wasn't just him. It happened convergently in several different places from both capitalist and socialist thinkers. Yeah. And if you're working from Michelle's Pareto and Weber, Weber is the least evil. Uh, Kyle, I think you were going to say something. No, that's fine. Uh, yeah, I think I covered that point uh, to the degree that I wanted to. <laughs> um, okay, so that's the end of this one. Any final stuff on this chapter? Any overall thoughts now that we've kind of done the... I think this is the, the longest chapter by far in the book, The Shadow of Exploitation. Any, I think so. Like, uh, I kind of... I'm going to stick by my thing that we've been talking about just at the end there about like how I think that there is kind of glaring holes or things that aren't being discussed by Wright himself. And I think we'll see this tendency throughout the book become more obvious. But uh, in this chapter, my antennas were up. That's the way I would say it. Yeah. To speak to interests one more time, I do think that the construction of class interests is where a lot of these potentially normative and instrumentalizing theoretical postulates are at play. But the principle itself is something that I think pro-revolutionaries in like the political sense can work with. Because without this notion of class interests, it's hard to see what like Marxists are doing. Like, what is in the interest of the proletariat if there isn't anything that you can like zoom in on then like yeah that's fine yeah. i mean it's fine it's totally fine it's just 
he is delimiting the scope of what those interests imply. It's like you yes. have the most limited form, which is the Weberian one, where workers uh, have a kind of corporate interest that is self-centered, short-sighted, and ultimately self-destructive. Uh, then you have rights perspective, which is, no, no, workers can like actually bargain, given the reality of exploitation, to achieve a uh, relatively better standard of living within capitalism. And you could say perhaps there is a horizon beyond that that is implied in worker interests. It's in the class interest. It's just that right doesn't bring it up because what they're really doing, sort of agreeing on the kinds of activities that workers do, but like reframing it. You know? I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I think it's interesting. Um when I read this book, because I do think trying to reconcile Weber with Marx to some degree is super important for understanding the actual lived experience of most people in class and why Marxist typologies are kind of so hard to convince people of. And the emergence of weirdo new, like, I feel like every five years I see a new weird ass class formulation that tries to get to the lived experience of now, but that completely brackets out how now is reproduced, whether it's the salariat or the precariat or the PMC or, you know, our, um, right. the subaltern. What was Zizek's really weird one? The, the salary bourgeoisie, which was particularly stupid. I mean, like, <laughs> <laughs> what is that? <laughs> <laughs> can, can we, can we talk about this, Tom? I mean, I, I, I'm sure we all have conclusions, but what, what do we, <laughs> <laughs> this is poor old Prince Philip. He's been buried today. I thought we should all wave him goodbye when we're signing oh. out of our. <laughs> all right. <laughs> At the end so of I... our. Is it, is it just oh. me, or I couldn't figure out if you were putting up like input, <laughs> like some Star Wars extra, you know, some vague yeah. British Nazi allegory, or like what? Like, no, no. Looks, yes. a little, looks a little like he Star wasn't a Nazi. He was, he was just a monarchist. I, right. I, was there British. is a, there is a difference, right? There yeah. is a difference. Yeah. He killed Nazis, you know. I didn't sure. say it was a Nazi. I said is I was wondering if he was putting up somebody who looked like he didn't um, kill Nazis. Somebody from Star Wars. <laughs> is all his family were Nazis? I was going to say members family? of the KKK. He fought in the war, Nazis right? Movies, so no, yeah. he didn't. I don't think so. No, he was. A I thought he friend. did. Do we have anything else to say about the book? I was trying to say something, but I give up now. This is totally. Yeah, I was about to. I was about to just say the D word so we can get this over with. <laughs> all, right, <laughs> all, right, all right. All right. Okay. Yeah. Well, Sorry for anyway. doing that. I wasn't supposed to put it up there. I, I was trying to put it on my side, but the fucking thing opened on the wrong side, and then I was going to bring it in for the last oh for God. the end. That's, that's what so happened. Fun. So I didn't that's mean to so distract everybody. Fun. No, it's okay. Um, I broadly agree that. Okay, Tom. Classic. I just. I want to, for the record. Citing the great source of knowledge, Wikipedia. During the Second World War, Prince Philip, Duke of Edinburgh, served with distinction in the Mediterranean and British Pacific fleets. So he killed fascists, but not Nazis. That's fair. You know, just, well, just... yeah, that's true. Actually. <laughs> no, well, there was not, no, there was Nazis. They might have shot down some Nazis, you know. Yeah, but it didn't. Didn't like didn't four of his sisters marry Nazis? I'm pretty sure. Yeah, I'm just saying. Like, I'm talking about him. That's all. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he okay, didn't marry okay, the Nazis. So there could be different flavors of reactionary. Let's move on. Yeah, um, yeah. It was yeah. just. It's just like everybody on fucking woke Twitter is like, "Oh, he was a Nazi." It's like it's not true. No, different reactionaries Nazi, exist. Yeah. But your deep Canadian royal cuckism is coming out, Kyle. Fucking right. <laughs> Fuck this. No, I, I hate him, but I hate, I hate people who are just like everyone is a Nazi even more. Uh, oh well, yeah. I mean, there's a special right. place in left and left non-existent hell for everyone who's called everyone a Nazi too much. Everyone is called everyone. I don't know. This is a fucking to... hill I'm gonna die on. This is a fucking hill I'm gonna die on. He was a Nazi. <laughs> not anymore. <laughs> he was a Nazi. Let's see with the scar. He was a Nazi. Oh god. Oh, I, you know I what? Mean, John Wayne wasn't a Nazi either. He's just a regular one. What what this leads to is you call everybody 
who is of that generation a Nazi, and then you could just excuse all of the crimes of the British Empire because being British wasn't bad enough. That's true. Never mind. You you won me over, Kyle. You won me over. You're correct. Being no, British Kyle, is bad enough. He's the worst. He's a British Nazi. <laughs> All right. Points about class interests are officially deferred. To next. Okay. I, was, I, was still, I was still hoping that I could like leap in there somehow. Nope. It's over. It's, it's over. over. Let's go. Uh, end broadcast. <laughs>